Well, let me add my welcome to that of Tim's. Good day to you all. It's so lovely to have you here for uh, the second of our three celebrations today. Thank you for joining us. I hope you've had a great half term if you get half terms. And uh, I hope you're having a great weekend uh, as well. Uh, there's certainly, if our part of the community is anything to go by, uh, lots of work in the gardens going on. The hedge trimmers have been uh, making noises. The, the grass has been cut in one or two places. It actually stopped raining. And maybe we might even get to enjoy the gardens this afternoon if the sun holds out. Some of us were saying farewell to a sporting great, uh, Johnny Wilkinson. Anyone watch Johnny Wilkinson finish his international career last night? It was a, an amazing moment. Um, just an incredible... Thank you, darling. You were there with me, I remember. <laughs> It's just an amazing thing in a world uh, governed by money and uh, arrogance and conceitedness to find somebody who's been at the top of his game for so long is actually British and has humility attached to the whole thing as well. And to see him go out on a high was an amazing thing. So his career has come to an end today. We're drawing to an end uh, on a little series uh, called Preview. You may remember I kicked it off by telling you a story about a, a film and a trailer of a film uh, that starred uh, Tim and Hills. Uh, and a number of you apparently actually believed it was true. Such was the brilliance of the performance that I put on, for which I'm looking forward to receiving a Grammy or an Oscar sometime in the future. Most of you wanted to ask Hills, who knew nothing about it, nor did Tim actually, uh, which one of them got the towel. Well, I'm not going to do a sequel, um, but how many of you, are talking about movies, how many of you have seen the film Inception? I, I would expect a lot of people from the evening congregation, a few of you have seen the film Inception. It's uh, it, for those of you that don't know, it's a story of a man who enters the world of corporate espionage uh, and somehow moving into people's sort of dream worlds, into their minds, to alter their thinking and to steal their ideas and their reality. And it was one of those films that, that I purposely chose not to see any trailers for, not to see any previews for. Uh, I'd heard from some friends that it was uh, highly creative and, and highly confusing. And, and I, I thought, well, I just want to go there with a friend. And I think I went with Sam and Will. Just um, uh, watch, you know, well, I'll, take my, I'll get my coffee and I'll get my Revels or my Maltesers or whatever it was. And I'll try and figure it out from the beginning. And gee, the truth is, I watched that film and I couldn't figure it out. Did, did anyone figure it out first time round? Yeah, I just didn't, I didn't you know, I, so, you know, I, I had to uh, watch it again uh, so, and pay attention to it. And I, I sort of quite like those films where you have to pay attention to every detail, every conversation, every little thing in the background, every setting, as it were. And, and then sort of trying to work out whether I've missed anything along the way. And then at the end of it, the whole thing sort of coming together. Well, it didn't for me uh, the first time, so I had to watch it a second time. Uh, and, and, you know, that's the way that God... It's made me when it comes to a film or a TV show or something like that. Um, you know, maybe he's made you sort of slightly differently, but, but those of you that know me well will know that by and large I'm not a great detailed person. You know, I, I'm not all sure that I understand the point of detail, but, and, uh, but when it comes to a movie or, or a series like Spooks or anything like that, I'm all eyes and ears and I'm very attentive. Now, for many of us, one of the words that really means a lot that we really love is the word clarity. It is a concept that appeals to us. And, and as we wrap up this sort of little series that a few of us have sort of taught in uh, over the last sort of few weeks in Matthew 8, uh, what we've seen is that every miracle that Jesus has worked in this chapter has helped us gain a greater clarity into who Jesus is and what it is that he's capable of doing. So if you weren't here on the first week, you know, in a sense, we sort of stood up on our tiptoes at the back of the crowd and we watched Jesus heal this man who had leprosy. We saw him demonstrate his power and his authority over the physical body. Uh, last weekend, if you were here last weekend, uh, Mike in the morning, uh, I was doing it in the evening, we, we, we saw Jesus walk into a graveyard and we, we watched him demonstrate his authority uh, over two demon-possessed men. You know, and, and we saw him demonstrating his power ultimately over the spiritual forces of, you know, that are at work in the heavenly realms. And this week, we're going to row out in a boat with Jesus to the middle of a lake, okay? And we're going to see him demonstrate his power and his authority over the created, over the physical, over the natural world. And here's the thing. With each miracle that Jesus performs in the gospel, something bigger and greater is being played out on this journey. He's, he's pulling back, a little bit like the preview, a little bit like a trailer, okay? He's pulling back the, the curtain, 
And he's giving us a glimpse into a, a, great, a greater reality, a newer reality, a, a better reality, and ultimately a restored reality. Uh, Philip Yancey, in his book, The Jesus I Never Knew, um, has anyone read that book? I'm always keen to know who's read what. You know, it is an amazing book. It is a great book. Uh, Philip Yancey says this, to put it mildly, God is no more satisfied with this earth than we are. Jesus' miracles offer a hint of what God intends to do about it. Some see miracles as an implausible suspension of the laws of the physical universe. However, they serve just the opposite function. Death, decay, entropy and destruction are the true suspensions of God's laws. Miracles, hear this, miracles are the early glimpse of restoration. I believe that in the depth of my being. I believe that is accurate, what he says. I believe that is true. And, and in this chapter in Matthew 8, so we're just going back a few verses from last week, in verse 23, we read this. Then he, Jesus, got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Now, back in uh, 1986, uh, there were two fishermen uh, out on the Sea of Galilee who were sort of living and fishing in and around uh, the ancient village that is known as Capernaum, and they uncovered a boat. So, Peter, we're just going to see this now. And uh, you know, as, as there was a drought, basically, and as the waters began to recede on the lake, sticking up out of what used to be the bottom of the lake uh, was the top of a boat. And eventually it was sort of uncovered, it was removed, and archaeologists dipped the wood into all sorts of chemicals over a number of years and, and in it, so that, they, that those chemicals would hold it together. And then it was put on display for everybody to see. And, and based on the, um, the, the wood in this boat and the nails used in the construction of this boat and fishing hooks that were found around the boat and some pottery that was found around the boat, it's been dated back to the first century and it's been named the Jesus Boat. So, so a boat like this uh, would have been used for fishing and transportation on the Sea of Galilee. You know, I don't want to get carried away with this, but a boat like this, maybe this was the one. We don't know that it wasn't the one. Maybe a boat like this, maybe this was the one that Jesus climbed into with his disciples after a long day of teaching and uh, a long day of healing those that were sick. And then in verse 24, it says this, Without warning, a furious storm came upon the boat so that the waves swept over the boat. Now, if you were to uh, travel to Israel, Mike goes on a regular basis, he takes trips with him, he's got another one coming up in the not distant future, it's being advertised in our literature, I know that a number of you have been. Um, in it, but if you were to travel to Israel and see the Sea of Galilee, most of us, based on, on, on what we're surrounded by, because we're an island, we're surrounded by huge amounts of water and sea. We would just refer to it as a very big lake. Okay, from the northern tip to the bottom tip, it's about 30 miles uh, length and widthways, it's about eight miles. Uh, but what most people can't see when they're looking at this lake with the naked eye is that it's way below sea level, about 650 feet below sea level, and it is surrounded on multiple sides with mountains. So when the wind comes through this little valley, it creates what climatologists call the tunnel effect. And in a matter of seconds, this little lake that can be very placid and calm one minute can go to something that is extremely violent and destructive the next. And so the word that Matthew uses in this passage of the storm is the Greek word seismos, from which we get the word seismic, which we use this day to describe you know, what is known as an earthquake. And so, and so the, again, the key point is that you can be on a boat in the Sea of Galilee, on this lake of Galilee, and in a matter of moments, you can be engulfed. And the word used here is it, it, it swept over the boat, says Matthew. It actually means hidden, okay, so that, uh, that, that because of the size of the waves and the enormity of, of the storm, the fierceness of the storm, you know, um, you, you can actually see the boat. Now, you know, I don't know what a modern-day equivalent of that would, would be. You know, if I hadn't had this experience about three weeks ago, I might have said the film, a film like A Perfect Storm. Have you seen that one where you know, uh, the climate sort of works in such a way as to create this extraordinary storm? Have you not seen that film? That's a scary one. Uh, Tim and I had our inversion of, of A Perfect Storm, as far as we were concerned, about three weeks ago when we went on Gareth's stag do. And uh, I'm not quite sure why we were asked, actually. I mean, of course, we're friends, but maybe he just wanted us to go and pray for him and look after him. Uh, um, but but uh, th th what, what we did was we went sailing in the Solent. Uh, and it was a huge privilege. It was a great joy. And there were two boats. There was a small boat and a big boat. 
Gareth was on the big boat with all his sailing friends, and on the small boat there was Tim, I, uh, our, our two sons, uh, James and Sam, and Hannah's boyfriend, Tim, and another worship leader called Chris, and, and, uh, and it was fine. We rocked up, and you know, the worship leaders that were on the boat looked as they were going to lead a worship uh, session as far as I was concerned. They, they were not wearing the right gear at all. Uh, we got on the boat, and our skipper was around the world clipper sailor skipper. He was amazing, okay? He was fantastic. He gave us all the safety instructions and none of the crew paid any attention whatsoever. It just went health and safety right over the top of their heads. And it was fine when we set off in the um, humble estuary and we headed out towards Kaz. It was absolutely fine until we hit open sea. Where there was a force eight, force nine blowing, and, uh, and winds are 55 miles an hour, and Gareth and his team in their slightly bigger boat were sort of cutting through the waves quite happily. And our little thing was <laughs> panning away like this. And one minute we could see them, the next minute we were down there and we couldn't see them. And, and you know, people were going green, and there was this awful moment when, when I was at the helm, uh, and everyone else was sort of tied on. And I looked at our skipper, who we didn't have enough um, lines to sort of tie everyone on. He wasn't tied on. He was running around on the deck, and I looked at him, and thought, if he goes in, the next most experienced sailor on this boat is me. (laughs) I've sailed a few mirrors and been on a boat in Turkey where there's no wind, there are no tides, there's no nothing. It's just rather, and I'm thinking, do you know what? Everyone really paid attention to the safety procedures when, you know, when the weather got really, really bad. And uh, we were sort of trying to hold on to things around the edge of the boat. We were sort of making sure that we weren't in positions of, uh, you know, vulnerability. And and it's that sort of picture that I have of, 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 of the Sea of Galilee and what's happening here, this sort of storm, as it were. And, you know, the, 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 you know, this little boat that we saw, they've got nothing to hold on to. It's really scary. Now, as all of this is happening in this story, this seismic activity on the water, okay, um, Matthew adds what I think is an interesting sort of little editorial note here, okay, which gives us, I think, a glimpse into the humanity of Jesus. It just says, but Jesus was sleeping. Now, how many of you here are light sleepers? Hands up, you know. How many of you are really heavy sleepers and, uh, you know, you sort of need a medicine ball dropped on you first thing in the morning to wake you up? Okay, that's the picture. And Jesus is not a light sleeper here, okay? He's exhausted. He's absolutely shattered. He's, he's counting the sheep or doing his times tables. And, uh, and as he's lying there, you know, one of the disciples comes along and puts a little bit of shaving foam in his hand and gets a little feather out and tickles in one of the nodes and says, Master, would you, would you mind waking up sort of thing? And... Uh, Goodness me, Jesus, we're in a desperate situation. You've got to get us out of this hole. This is really scary. In fact, the words they use here are salvation words. Lord, you've got to save us. We're going to drown. So there is a high level of anxiety in this boat that I suspect that a number of us could relate to. When we had a, a, a little sabbatical uh, about eight or nine years ago, we went to um, Canada and we went uh, whitewater rafting uh, and with Carrie's brother and their family, and we, we went with a company called Wet and Wild. We should have known the clue was in the name of the company, actually. Um, but, but uh, again, you know, w- w- if you go whitewater rafting, you have to follow the safety procedures really carefully. And we were being told that we were going out, and do you have grades for sort of uh, uh, rapids? And, 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 and we were going to grade four or grade five rapids. And, and, and the dangerous thing that this guy told us about this trip was that, that, that not only were there sort of grade four and grade five sort of rapids, but there were high cliffs and rocks on either side of the river at stages. So if we fell out, of the river as it were, into the, you know, then there was nothing to get hold of. And you know, what happens is people fall out is you get caught in what they describe as the washing machine cycle. You, know, you go under, then you have the pressure of the water on top and it's turning you over and eventually you're being spun around and you succumb to, you know, to, you know, to a lack of oxygen. And if you, if you find yourself in that sort of situation, if you're out of the water, you're going to panic. They're panicking here. I remember, I think it was uh, our niece, um, Hannah's cousin, uh, just sort of almost sort of falling out, and as she went out, the, 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 the guide at the back sort of uh, grabbed her and pulled her back in again, and I thought, he was so cool. It was almost worth sort of encouraging him to do it again, because it was just his speed of reaction was fantastic. He was absolutely brilliant. Um, um, be, and if she'd gone in, it would have been disastrous. Now, all of us have a natural tendency towards fear, I think, when it comes to water. It's not that we fear having a bath or a shower in the morning. We're okay with that, you know. But we can at times fear what water can do to us. We fear drowning. 
I think it's that natural fear, actually, that natural thing that John plays off in the book of Revelation when he's describing the reality of hell to us. You know, he can't come up with sort of enough words and metaphors, so he describes it as a lake of burning fire. So, you know, what does he mean by that? He, he plays on those two sort of instinctive fears that we have, you know, one of burning and one of drowning. That is the, this is the worst possible scenario ever here. And, and, and so these disciples are in that sort of situation. They are in, in this moment, you need to understand this, a living hell. And they're saying, rescue us, Jesus. Get us out of this mess. Uh, it was a very, very long time ago, and I know it looks almost impossible, but uh, just when I was a student, I, I had a little stint as working as a lifeguard um, um, down in a little bay in Cornwall called Trianon Bay. It's a little, um, anyone ever been to Trianon Bay? It's just there. It's a great surfing beach. It's a very small bay, and, uh, um, and it's, it's quite a dangerous bay um, if, if um, the tides are really bad. And I remember being involved in helping pull one person out of the water who'd been caught in the rocks over on the left-hand side of the beach, and they'd been pulled back by currents and rip tides and, and just being there w- w- with others and pulling them out of the water and you know, they came out of the water they were very limp and they were being treated and, g- and being given CPR and, and you know I, I remember that and it helped create within me a really healthy fear and, and respect for the natural physical world that we have absolutely no control over we think we do because we have people that tell us the weather forecast you know, we have meteorologists, you know, you know, that tell us what might happen, but, but we can't stop it from happening. We just can't. And, and I guess for me, I want to talk about this natural world, this fallen world. You know, it, it's affected by sin as much as we are. And it's in need of salvation as much as we are. You see, when, when sin entered um, the creation, four separations between God and the physical world took place. I, let me just mention them really briefly. One was that human beings were alienated from, from God. You know, the, you know, this is the big one. God no longer walks uh, in the cool of the garden with us as he did with uh, Adam and Eve. That There's this distance, this tension, this separation between God and humanity. Yet secondly, human beings were alienated from, from one another. So, so, you know, sin drove a, a wedge between Adam and Eve and, and, and that they recognized, the, that their, their eyes were open to their nakedness. They, they experienced and they felt shame for the very first time. And as a result, that which we want the most, to love and be loved, is that which requires the most work from us. Thirdly, uh, 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 human beings were uh, alienated from the animal world. So the lion and the lamb no longer lie down beside one another. There is this pecking order in the animal kingdom. You know, this eat or, or be eaten sort of law that governs their interaction. It's why we don't take certain animals into children's sort of zoos where the rabbits and the, you know, the, the small pets are. You, know, you wouldn't put a... You wouldn't put a a lion in there, for instance, you know, because of their danger, because of their ferociousness. And fourthly, uh, human beings were alienated from the natural world. That's what I'm talking about today. Now, this planet that we, that we inhabit it is at war with itself and its occupants. You know, from tsunamis to mudslides to volcanoes to forest fires, of which there seem to be more and more, as far as I can see. And it's like the Earth has indigestion, and, and, and we're the cause, and we're the, the, the source of that heartburn, which, because it always seems to take it out on us. So let me remind you of this. The work of Jesus on the cross and his victory over death launched what we understand, what we know as redemption. And, and redemption is the restoration of everything that is corrupted by sin. In other words, Jesus came to do one main thing and one main thing alone. That is to begin a new creation process. And your life and my life and the life of this church, Trinity, is to be an outpost, as it were, of the Garden of Eden. We are to be a colony of heaven. And this clear, clear picture of all that is beautiful and all that is whole and in the midst of this war that is taking place outside of us where everything is tainted and fragmented and, and broken. I love the way Paul puts it in uh, Romans 8, and this is the message version, Romans 8, verse 18. I don't think there's any comparison between the present hardships in our times and the coming times. 
The created world itself could hardly wait for, 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 for what is coming next. Everything in creation is being more or less held back. I think this is huge. God reigns it in. So both creation and all the creatures are ready and can be released at the same moment into the glorious times ahead. The second coming of Jesus launches that. Uh, but um, meanwhile, the joyful anticipation deepens all around us. We observe a pregnant creation. We've been talking about pregnancy uh, earlier on uh, with, uh, with Helen. The difficult times of pain throughout the world are simply birth pangs. But it is not only all around us, it's within us. The Spirit of God is arousing us within. We, we're also feeling the birth pangs. These sterile and barren bodies of ours are yearning for full deliverance. That is why waiting does not diminish us any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. We are enlarged in waiting. We, of course, don't see what is enlarging us, but the longer we wait, the longer we become, uh, um, the, the larger we become, and the more joyful our expectancy. That There is this longing. There is this yearning. Let me um, just illustrate it this way. Uh, all of us in this room remember seeing the uh, devastating effects of the tsunami in uh, Thailand and, and Indonesia. Peter, can, can we just watch this? A wall of water, you know, three stories tall, laying waste to anything and everything in its wake after a matter of moments. It just came crashing in. And that, that tsunami goes against everything that God designed this planet to do and all that God created, you know, creation to experience. The, the equilibrium and harmonious balance has all been tipped. And thus we say in Christian circles that the world is fallen. But there is a day coming. What's it going to reverse? When God will hit the rewind button. And all that has been done to this planet will be undone. And all the disease and all the destruction and all the devastation and all the death will be reversed in the blink of an eye. So don't miss this, please. You know, all of creation is longing for the completeness of the new creation. But until that time comes, until all those alienations are undone and all the disequilibrium and disharmony harmony is recalibrated and God hits that rewind button, we still have to deal with the devil and we have to deal with his demon army. And one of the ways they continue to pester us, one of the ways they continue to attack us is through natural disasters. The German theologian uh, Jürgen Moltmann captured it for me best when he said, and I love this, Jesus' healings are not supernatural miracles in a natural world. They are the only truly natural thing in a world that is unnatural, demonized, and wounded. And here's what I think he means by demonized. After Jesus sort of assesses the storm, as it were, the passage says that he stands up in the front of that little boat decay and he rebuked the wind and he rebuked the waves and it was completely calm. And, and, and the word used there for rebuke is the same word that, that Jesus, that described what Jesus did to the two demon-possessed guys. You know, last weekend he rebuked the demons and living with them, that's where Mike took us, and he cast them out, he sort of drove them out. In other words, in this story, Jesus is demonstrating his power over the destructive forces of nature which remain under the devil's influence even in this day. In other words, I think Jesus is acknowledging the fact that God didn't create the world to harm human beings but to provide for them. And I don't want to burst anyone's sort of church feel-good bubble here uh, this morning, but I do want to say this. This passage has been mispreached and mistaught for a very, very long time. The application of this story is not about how Jesus can come into your personal life and can calm the personal storms of your life. Of course, Jesus can come in to the personal storms of your life and calm the personal storms of your life. He's done that on many occasions for me and for many of us, and we prayed that over people. But I, I want you to have absolute clarity on this passage, Matthew 8. It's why we spent three weeks just on one chapter. Okay, This story is the hinge. This is crucial. This story is not about you or me. This story is about the identity of Jesus. And it's so easy at times to make what we do about us and to make Bible passages about us. Okay, This is not about you. It's not about me. This is about Jesus. Okay, Listen to what the disciples say in verse 27. The men in the boat were amazed and they asked... What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. 
You know, so I want us to have clarity on this. You know, this is huge theologically. The God who slept in the front part of this boat is the same God who rested on the sixth day after creation. You know, this man who says to the winds and the waves, obey me, he is the creator God. He's not just healing leprosy and blindness and deafness in this scene, and those things are big things, okay, but he's speaking directly to the winds and the waves, and he's saying, you will listen to me, and you will obey me. I am your creator. I am the one who's come to redeem you. And he rebukes them, and he drives the demons out, as it were, of the physical reality, and they obey that voice. Why? Because they recognized the voice. You know, the same voice that said, let there be wind, and there was wind, and let there be waves, and there, was, there were waves. And that same voice is speaking to us today and saying, do you really know who I am? You see, Jesus doesn't want us to shrug our sort of shoulders in timid nature or, or fear and say, well, 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 maybe I do. Sometimes I have a bit of an idea as to who it is that you are. I pop along to Trinity on the occasional weekend and I go to a life group whenever I can sort of, and say that helps me a little bit. You know, no. He wants us to have absolute clarity. And I want us to have clarity. One of my favorite lines, I'm mentioning a few writers and scholars and theologians today. Um, this is a big issue. Uh, it's a guy called Walter Wink. What a great name, eh? Yeah, Walter Wink. I mean, that is just fantastic. I love it. He says this. I love this. If Jesus had never lived, we would not have been able to invent him. I love that. That's how unique Jesus is. And so I want to talk a little bit about this person called Jesus and my understanding of him as I begin my descent, as it were. I don't know what your first picture of Jesus was like, but my first picture of Jesus, um, as far back as I can remember, was actually, if I'm being honest, that he was a little bit of a magician. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd heard the stories about him being a miracle worker, and uh, I, I rather like the stories of uh, him being a miracle worker, but I sort of tended to associate him with a sort of magician that could pull out a 10 piece, piece from behind someone's ears and, you know, and sort of m m you know, do a great party trick or something like that. And, and, and then I sort of moved on a little bit from that problem, and I, I got to what was then Sunday school, but for us kids' church, okay, and, and I remember sort of being told about how nice Jesus was and how nice he was to other people. And I sort of began to develop this picture of him being a bit of a, a St. Francis of Assisi type character and uh, that he was lovely to animals and he was lovely to people and he was nice and, you know, and, and, and I was encouraged to be nice to my neighbours. And, and Jesus felt a little bit like a comfortable cardigan. I mean, I haven't got a comfortable cardigan, but you know, if, if I had one, it'd be, he'd, it'd be that sort of picture, putting on a comfy cardigan. And then, uh, and then I sort of became aware in, in my... Um, uh, grandmother's house of a, of a big framed picture of Jesus, a really big framed one, and, and he had very long flowing hair and a beard, and uh, he looked sort of slightly malnourished, if I'm honest, and a little bit ticked off, and, 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 and slightly disappointed with life, and, and in a sense, you know, I began to have this picture of hippie Jesus. He looked like a hippie to me at times. Then, then as I got into sport and I became aware of football and the World Cup, you know, things like that, I, I saw this statue of Jesus in Rio de Janeiro. This huge, whopping great big statue of the Christ. And I thought, oh my goodness, he's huge, he's massive, he's a whopping great big, uh, he's a big guy. And I started to get confused, actually. You know, one minute he's a hippie, the next minute he's ticked off, the next minute he's St. Francis of Assisi. And which one is he? Which one am I supposed to follow? You know, which one am I supposed to believe in or give my life to? And, uh, you know, it didn't just boil down to the pictures of, uh, uh, that I saw of Jesus as well. You know, there, was, there was all sorts of places where the lack of clarity came from as a... As a family, we used to give thanks for our food when we'd sit around the table. It's a really good thing to do as a family, by the way, to thank Jesus for his grace and his provision. But my father would always finish that grace, or with his, any prayer that seemed to go on for a very long time. You can see where you get it from. Um, in Jesus' name. And that's what he'd do. And I thought, you know, in Jesus' name. And, and that was fine until I went off to school and I got involved in sport a little bit. And, and, and Jesus' name, particularly in the word of rugby, gets used in all sorts of different ways. Uh, not normally as an answer to prayer, you know. I mean, I distinctly remember one moment when our rugby coach was so ticked off with the team that he got his whistle, he blew his whistle, wanted to stop the game. You know how embarrassing it is if you're a coach or a teacher? You blow your whistle, it didn't work properly. Gave off a little shrill sort of screech. He was embarrassed by that. He got his clip, when he threw it on the ground, kicked the ball, which hit the post, and said, in JC's name, why are you? And, you know, it was blasphemous. And my 
world of sport revolved in and around rugby where Jesus' name got used in vain an awful lot. And I used to sort of wonder, why didn't they just use the name Gandhi? Or Tony Benn? Or to equal things out, Margaret Thatcher? I don't know. I, you know, because we were just down the line, politically in the middle here. But do you know, as I got older and I started reading and thinking for myself, I, I sort of moved from that family faith, sort of kids' church faith, to, to no faith at all, as many of you will know, before I found a personal faith. And I found myself trying to wrestle with and figure out whether this stuff was real. And I remember reading a, a, this line a little while ago that captures it so well for me. Uh, I just read this. More has been written about Jesus in the past 20 years than in the previous 19 centuries combined. Hill came into my office the other day, and she said... Uh, if you just had one book to explain Jesus, which one would it be? And I thought I was paralyzed in that moment. I looked around my bookshelf saying, which one would it be? And there are one or two. Actually, the truth is for me now, it would be a book by Judah Smith called Jesus Is. Fill in the blank. It's a great book. It's a great book for any age, honestly. It's a fantastic book. Um, but the truth is there are so many books out there. And not only is his picture plastered everywhere and his name written everywhere, but there's all this writing. And so you would think that all of us, that everyone on this planet would have some clarity about this guy because there was nobody, there has been nobody more popular than Jesus. But for some reason, there are lots of people who are still asking this question. What kind of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? So let me sort of turn the corner a little bit and... Uh, come down a few thousand feet and say it this way, you know, th th this has been for me a deeply personal journey over the years. It's been a real challenge for me as I've studied devotionally for myself, as I've sought to be obedient and I've sought to hear God's voice for my own direction, as, as I've read and prayed and put my heart and mind into that sort of study. And there are days when I'm sort of preparing messages for for this church and for other places. And I, you know, I don't want the Bible just to be a textbook, you know, and, uh, you know I, and just spend all my time in grammar and words and that sort of thing. But, but you know, over the years, I've been trying to explain who Jesus is. I've tried to explain who Jesus is to, 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 to my children. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm imagining what it might be like because I think grandparents, parents, I love what um, Liz, Auntie and Lizzie said earlier on. You know, if you're an auntie or an uncle, you, know, you have a role to play in, in shaping the culture of the young people that we have connection with. You know, and those of us that are older and more wrinkly, we are contending for the faith of our children. You know, I'm, I'm imagining, I was doing it yesterday afternoon actually, imagining how I might talk about Jesus to any grandchildren we might have. Now, there aren't any on the way as far as I'm aware, but... Um, but one day it will happen, God willing. What part do we get to play in that? Well, I, I imagine sitting, having a coffee with somebody who's a skeptic, questioning, you know, and at times I find myself struggling in those moments. And it's like if I could sort of create a metaphor, a metaphor for this, it's like I'm in the Sistine Chapel and you've got the, the ceiling of the chapel with all the beautiful paintings of, you know, from the Bible and all the images and you're on top of scaffolding lying on your back and, and the paintings are covered with dirt and you've got a little cotton earwood, or earbud and you're trying to clear away the dirt to sort of bring a bit of clarity to the, the picture that people could see as it were and because there's so much misunderstanding and there, there's so much confusion and there are so many sort of church scandals, that, 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 you know, there's so much hypocrisy, there's so much sin that has existed over the years, and, but, and you contend with that, I'm working on it, because I, I would want people perhaps just to give me a little bit of a hearing, so that I could just perhaps give them a little more clarity on who this guy, Jesus, really is, and at times I say this, it is a struggle, and, and maybe the reason why so many people lack clarity when it comes to the identity of Jesus is the same reason that the disciples lacked it. So, so, so let me put Matthew 8 in its proper context in the whole book, as it were, and then I'm finished. If you go back to the very beginning of Matthew, uh, you start with his birth, and he, it says that he was born of a virgin girl. And, and in that moment, he fulfills hundreds of years' worth of prophecy to the letter, so much so that people in his day, from you know, shepherds to wise men to political leaders, you know, they, they got it. There was no confusion for them. There was absolute clarity, okay? You know, this guy is the Messiah, he is the long-awaited leader of Israel. But that doesn't mean that they assume that the Messiah was also going to claim to be, or show himself to be, the Son of God. They are two very huge and different concepts, Messiah and Son of God. And they're scratching their heads a little bit about this guy. 
And, and then he sort of rocks up. He shows up on uh, the mountainside. And he begins to teach. And, and they're listening to him. All these people, they're listening to him as he teaches. It's the Sermon on the Mount. And they are floored. They've never heard teaching like this. Their jaws are dropping to the ground because it's so amazing. It's so astounding. And, and it says at the end of Matthew 7, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. Jesus gave them reason to believe that he was the Messiah. But this son of God thing, that's a whole curveball that is thrown at them and they're struggling to connect. And then they get to Matthew 8 and he starts healing people, which was not uncommon in those days. Other rabbis were used to bring healing. It's well documented, okay? It wasn't unique. What is unique is when he stands in the front of this boat and he says to the winds and the waves, obey me. And they obeyed him. Because that causes people not only to have to scratch their heads, as it were, but they have to move beyond the surface and they have to start asking questions about this man that have never been asked of any other human being who has ever walked on the face of the planet before. And they were sincere questions. And what they were after is the same thing that I've been after most of my life. And it's clarity. I want to know, is he really the son of God? You see, Jesus' plan, when people ask questions about his identity, was that they would look at you and me and our obedience. And would it match up to the obedience of the wind and the waves? That people would look at us and say, look how they live. How do they love like that? And in so doing, Jesus was hoping that they would be able to see that he really is who he claims to be. It hasn't quite worked out according to plan. It hasn't gone quite as comprehensively as Jesus might have hoped it would or designed it to be, and it's not because of Jesus. It's because of the people who came to be his followers, and I'm not indicting anybody here in this room apart from me. But I think that those of us who claim to be followers of Jesus, we have to stop asking the question, what kind of man is this? We have to start asking ourselves, what kind of people are we? I, I, I'm asking myself, what kind of man am I when I come to this kind of encounter in the gospel? And I think what we need to do, and I haven't got time to go there, but if you were later on this afternoon or this week, just to slip over into Matthew 23, in the final week of Jesus' life, you see Jesus giving one last message. And I think it's a clarifying moment for all of us who want to follow Jesus. Jesus here is talking about living a life of authenticity. If you were to ask people outside of the church, if you were to ask people in their teens, in their 20s or their 30s, what it is that they long to see more than anything else in people like us, it is authenticity. And Jesus is surrounded by people who are wearing religious masks, masks that have kept themselves from following Jesus as well as keeping other people watching them from following Jesus. And they've kept people from experiencing the identity of Jesus in their own lives. If you've never unpacked Matthew 23, that there's this very live, very authentic, call to authentic living here. And I think if you try to unpack it, your life will be enriched, you know, then you'll find yourself saying, this is what I've been after all my life. Do you, know, do you, do you want to know Jesus' voice? The sound of it? The distinctiveness of it? So that when he speaks to us, it's like, yeah, I get it, I've got it, okay. The, like the wind and the waves got it. A little while ago, the North Pole, parts of Canada, Alaska, Norway, Sweden, experienced what is known as a solar storm. And that, 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 that's particles that are swept off the, the sun, eventually hit the gases in our atmosphere, and eventually it all lights up in the most incredibly beautiful display. The only problem with that is that it destroys all our live transmissions and messes with modern day technology. I watched this little program on it and some time ago one of the scientists was talking about it and explaining it and as he did my mind went to Psalm 113 where it says from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets the name of the Lord is to be praised and just as I wrap this up I want to say that I'm just so grateful that I, I have clarity in my life on who put the sun in the sky who gave the stars their names 
how many hairs I've got on my head who told the oceans I'm going to draw a line in the sand and you can only come that far. I'm glad that I know him. Last weekend I was uh, down in a hospital with my father and uh, he talks about going home. We're not quite sure if he's going home to be with the Lord or he's going home to be with my mother at the moment because he sort of vacillates between um, um, getting better and not. But the one thing that's absolutely sure about him is as he talks is that he has absolute faith and hope in the reality of the resurrection. He knows where he's going ultimately. I love him for that. I really love him for that. At any time when somebody who, who dies, a faithful person who's walked with the Lord for years, dies in the life of this church, you know, I'm reminded of this truth, okay, that there is no dirt in the physical world that can hold us down. Because Jesus said, and I have absolute clarity over this, he said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. And anyone who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never, ever die. That is crystal clear. So I'm glad that I have clarity in my life over who it is that controls the seasons. I'm looking forward to summer. But I actually enjoy spring as well. Because spring always reminds me of new life. And that there's a lot of new life that comes up out of that dirt. Amen. Let's stand, shall we?